I tried recording this the first time, but it's measuring this mic, not the mic of my camera. Anyways, guys, I went to an event by hosted by Turning Point USA today. We uh, we had the speaker. His name is Representative Dan Crenshaw. He's a representer representative in Texas, I believe, District Two. Could be wrong on that one. Oh well. This event was actually surprisingly family friendly for the most part. I think there might be one or two swears, but actually letting you guys know, holy smokes, you're, you're actually my regular viewers are actually able to watch this. I'm mostly recording this for documentation's sake, but you know, if you want to have a conversation, please feel free to do so in the comments below. Just please, please, please keep it civil. All right, no being mean. In addition, I would like to apologize that I wasn't able to record the absolute whole thing. I missed out on two or three final questions, and this was mostly because my phone ran out of battery. <laughs> Not battery, sorry, space. My phone ran out of space once again. I think that's about all. Thank you so much for tuning in, and without further ado, hope you enjoy. All right, here we are at the Turning Point event. It's going to start in about 20 minutes. Lots and lots of people showed up. We've got security. We've got. It's gonna be great. I'm gonna go get a chair up here and, try and record the whole thing. See you guys then. Having trouble getting seats here. Kind of limited in space. Barely got a spot. It's gonna be great. distinct pleasure to introduce this man who not only served our country honorably for 10 years as a Navy SEAL, but somebody who continues to make veterans and Americans proud as a member of Congress right now. I introduce to all of you, Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Yeah. But I'm excited to be here. This is really, this is really cool. Um, I haven't done a lot of things like this. And uh, am I the first politician to do this with Turning Point? <laughs> Maybe. In any case, this is exciting. I, the, re the, reason, the reason I'm into this is because I care more about what young people think about politics really more than anything else. And um, I'm just happy to be here and, and share that with you. We're gonna have a we're gonna have an in-depth discussion today about socialism, uh, what it means, what it doesn't mean, what we think it means versus what self-proclaimed socialists thinks it think it means, and and then we're gonna talk about you know some of the cultural narratives that I think are important to to maintain a sustainable society, same cultural narratives that. That, uh, that America was founded on, that led to the narratives that the Constitution was founded on. And it's gonna get a little nerdy, maybe, and get a little wonky, and uh, hopefully it stays respectful. I'm not here to fight anybody. Um, I'm not saying I won't, but just, it's not what I came here for. I wanna have a, a, a good discussion, and, uh, and we'll definitely have time for questions. So the, the, the first thing I wanna tackle is, what do we really mean when we're talking about socialism? And on the right, as a conservative, I, I recognize that I think sometimes um, we're labeling people in, a, in, a, in the wrong way. And, and we find this out through data and surveys and, and just by talking, especially to young people. And it turns out like they don't actually mean socialism. So this is good news and bad news. <laughs> it's good news because they don't actually mean you know, state corporatist control of capital. And that's good because that doesn't work. And we're gonna go into why that doesn't work. But uh, it's bad news because now we're just, we're using labels incorrectly. We're, we're redefining things. And I don't, I don't find that useful. It's harder to have a conversation in a complex, divisive environment when we don't use normal definitions and when we're constantly changing definitions. So that's, that's the bad news. You know, and it's important to start too with what we agree on, I think, whether, whether you whether you claim to be a socialist or a capitalist or a free marketer or, or democrat or republican 
and, in, and I think the things we agree on is that we all want to be happy, we all want to be prosperous, we all want to be free to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We all want to be free to own property. We all want equality under the law. We want to start your own business and keep government out of your way. The, the interesting thing about some recent data is that while socialism has a, by, and this is, this is by the people that we surveyed, they will have a positive view of socialism. But they will also, in the same in the same survey, say that government has too much control over their lives. <laughs> so again, we're not defining things correctly. And and there's a, there's another interesting anecdote I'll give you. I was back in Houston. I was having uh, dinner with my wife, and I went up to the bar. This, this is a place where I've had a lot of events. So the people who work there, they know me. And I, and I was talking to the bartender, and she knows me. We, we've interacted many times. She's got tattoos all over her arms, and I was like, awesome tattoos. And uh, she said, yeah, you know, I'm very progressive, so I like tattoos. And I thought that was really interesting because I don't define progressivism that way. I, I have a very different definition of progressivism and what that means. Ta liking tattoos to me is not progressive. That's just somebody likes tattoos, and I like tattoos. I have one, a big one on my chest. But uh, I don't tell all my older voters that. <laughs> and so, it got me thinking, you know, I have a negative view of what it means to be a progressive. I do, because I, I, I attribute that to the Wilsonian era where we were literally locking up journalists and trying to do away with the Constitution. That's the first, that's the first time progressivism really reared its head, because it's progress at all costs. It's progress to change our constitutional foundations, and I, and I have a problem with that. But if I'm talking to somebody and I'm demonizing progressivism and they think progressive, progressivism is simply living free and getting tattoos, well, maybe I shouldn't be labeling them in a negative way. And it's something interesting that on the right, we, we have to consider a little bit more. But de depending on what we mean, whether we mean socialism in the true sense, the Soviet sense, or whether we mean it, or some people do, in the Finland sense, the Denmark sense of, of socialism, you know, let's actually look into that. And, and I will say first that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter, and here's why. Well-intentioned liberalism, meaning a focus on inequality and injustice, which is generally what my friends on the left care about most. And this isn't just my opinion, this is actually available in survey data, when we actually look at people's moral foundations and what they find important. And there's six moral foundations, caring and kindness, fairness, authority, meaning how, how you view the rule of law and how important that is to a society, uh, liberty, and then loyalty to a country or an in-group. Conservatives tend to actually think all of those are equally important. Liberals don't. Liberals tend to really just think that, that caring and kindness are important and that fairness is important. And when they say fairness, they're generally talking about an equality of outcome, meaning everybody has the same thing. That's what they mean by fair. Yeah, this, this isn't my opinion, you can look this up. Go to yourmorals.org or read Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind. It'll really open up your brain to how different liberals and conservatives think, and it's a really interesting read. But if, if your focus is on inequality, and it's always on inequality, I argue that inevitably you're gonna get to the conversation we're having these days where totalitarian socialism is the only answer to, to fix that inequality. As a politician, the easiest thing in the world is for me to keep promising people things. I can promise you more of this. I can promise you another program that's going to make your life better and better. And when we get that program, well, I've got to find something else to promise you. And to make your life better, to keep those promises, well, I've got to gain more power. And to gain more power, I've got to, well, I've got to keep promising more things. But when I run out of things to promise you, I've got to start using identity politics to promise you things. And this is really, really gets problematic because now we're, now we're splitting people up into different identities, whether that's based on race or gender or religion. We're convincing you that you're oppressed and then we're promising you more power over another group. Hmm. And if you want to understand why things are so resentful right now, so divided, I think that has a lot to do with it. Because we stopped viewing ourselves as Americans, we stopped caring about the colors of the red, white, and blue, and we started dividing people up into tribal hierarchies. And I think that's a really dangerous place to go. But let's talk about what true socialism is and see if you mean that. And then we'll talk about what the Nordic countries is and what the truth is behind that, whether they're really socialist or not. 
the thing about real socialism, meaning state control over, over the means of production, is that it really doesn't work. <laughs> so I hope we're not talking about that. But let's talk a little bit about why it doesn't work. First of all, it removes incentives. If you remove incentives to work or to make a profit, well then you have an entire society of people who don't really want to push forward. They don't really want to put the effort forward. It's really hard to sustain a society, especially a prosperous one, when there's a lack of incentives. The other thing about socialism is it's, it's someone else, in this case the government, spending someone else's money, and then somebody else is consuming that for free. So the result is that things are not economized, meaning they're not made more efficient. There's no incentive to make things more efficient because it's someone else's money. If you've ever worked for federal government like I have, you see that incentive take place. Frankly, the only reason it works in a place like the military is because there's a true sense of duty not to waste people's tax dollars. Does it still happen? You betcha. And I think it's worse in other federal agencies. The other problem is, is there's no incentive to seek out better value. Again, because you're getting it for free, so why would you care about trying to seek out something better? You're not going to compete between store A and store B and store C. You're not giving each one of them your business. You just have one thing, the government, giving you something for free. No incentive to make it better. The other impossible thing about socialism is that it's centrally planned. Central planning is the ultimate conceit. It's this belief that you're omniscient, frankly, that a group of experts who have wonderful degrees from places like this can actually figure out the most complex problems a society has. This is the ultimate conceit because in the end it's impossible. Have a group of experts in Washington try to wrap their heads around the most complex healthcare market in the world. It doesn't work. The fourth thing. When we make things free, we remove an economic term called willingness to pay. That, when you remove the willingness to pay, meaning what the price point is, all right, and the market establishes that naturally, it's that so-called invisible hand. We know what things cost because we know what people are willing to pay. When you remove that, what you're doing is the, the way that you distribute goods now is to see who's willing to wait in line the longest or to see who has the best connections. And if you look at old socialist countries like the Soviet Union, this is exactly what happened. And this has the effect of actually transferring more goods from people who don't need them, or sorry, from people who need them to people who don't need them. It's actually the reverse of equality. The other problem with doing things below market prices is that there's less production. And there's a lot of evidence for this too. Let's look at uh, even the Nordic countries right now. When you make something free the way they make education free, we can actually measure whether you get more value out of a college education or not, meaning, meaning what would your income would have been with or without that college education. And the OECD measures these things. It turns out that America is a heck of a lot better than even Nordic countries. Why? Because they've made their education free, perhaps, and people don't value it as much. And in practice, state control over the means of production doesn't work. The reason there was ultimate the famines that killed millions and millions of people in places like China, and Maoist China, and the Soviet Union, uh, and Ukraine, it's because the government decided that it was omniscient enough to figure out exactly what needed to be produced, who needed to produce it, how many laborers needed to be hired. They actually had the conceit to think that they could do it more efficiently than the market, and they ended up being wrong. So we have a lot of history to tell us this. But let's say this is not what you mean. And actually, most people don't mean this when they're talking about socialism. I want to grant people that. But let's say you're talking about the Nordic countries. Well, now the question becomes, are they really socialist? I would argue that, no, they're not. In fact, as conservatives, we have a lot to like about Nordic countries. First of all, they have lower corporate tax rates. Until the recent tax plan that was passed, Nordic countries had far lower tax rates than we did. Now we're about on par. They also have just as good of a business environment, regulatory environment, if not better, it depends on who's doing the, the measurement and, and who's doing the study, but they have a much freer market than we do in many respects. There's no minimum wage, for instance. Their tax system is quite different from ours and not in the ways that you would expect. They have far more regressive tax policies, not progressive tax policies. So, for instance, they have a very high value-added tax, which is basically a consumption tax. It's basically a sales tax, up to 25%. Everything there is far more expensive. 
Now, a consumption tax is effectively a flat tax. It's something that a lot of free marketers really like. It puts the burden of tax on everybody. It also puts it on people who are visiting, tourists, immigrants, things like that. They have a much lower, in some cases, or even no estate tax. Our top effective tax rate for income isn't even all that different either. It's actually only 3% lower than their top effective income tax rate. And if you don't believe me about progressivity, the OECD actually measures this. And it turns out the United States is one of the most highly progressive uh, tax structures there is. The Nordic countries are at 1.01, that's a coefficient. So one means basically a flat tax, meaning Look, I'm the government and I tax all of you exactly the same no matter what you make. You all, you all get 10% taxed. That would be a one, a coefficient of one. The average of the Nordic countries is 1.01. The United States is about 1.35. We're far more progressive. Families earning $70,000 in, in Denmark would already be taxed at the top rate there, 46%. So they promise you a lot of things there. They say, we're gonna give you this stuff, but we are going to tax you for it. It's an honest conversation, at least, and I wish that were the conversation we were having here. He said, I wanna raise your taxes this much, I'll give you this. And that's effectively what they do, especially with their healthcare policies. The thing is, it's also not what you think. Their healthcare systems are largely decentralized. They tax at the municipal level. Now think about that. These are much smaller countries than even we are. And we're having a conversation about single payer at the federal level. That is so far to the extreme of what even Nordic countries do with their universal health care systems. The fourth thing I want to discuss with you guys real quick is the fundamental differences in between what the left and the right believe about the purpose of government. And these, these, this difference becomes really salient on the budget committee, which I'm a part of. We have an argument on the budget committee pretty often. It's what causes the debt. Everybody still agrees that debt is bad. This is the good news. The bad news is, is we have really fundamentally different ideas of why there's a debt. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle proclaim that the reason we have a debt is because of the tax cuts two years ago. As if history began two years ago, that's why we have a $22 trillion debt. And by the way, everybody your age has to pay off. I don't like that very much. The truth is, is that in 10 years, we would have a $31 trillion debt if the tax cuts had never been passed. With the tax cuts, we're gonna have around a $32 trillion debt. The math doesn't add up. We don't have a debt or deficits because of tax cuts. In fact, as a percentage of GDP, the government is taking in the same amount of federal revenue that we have been for, really, decades. It's always been averaged about 17%. We have record amounts of revenue coming into the federal government. Record amounts every single year. Next year, it's gonna be about $180 billion more than last year. Don't quote me on that exact number, but it's 100 and something, 150, 180 billion. We don't have a taxing problem. We are, it's not that we aren't taxing you enough. So what is causing the debt? Well, it's 70% of the spending that we never actually touch, mandatory spending. And hopefully we get into some questions about that because that directly affects everybody your age. But again, this speaks to a fundamental difference between how we view the purpose of government. I think one side views government as we should tax the people the maximum amount possible, mathematically possible, to do all the good programs that benevolent academics want to implement. Remember that group of experts mentality? We want to give that group of experts all the power to make sure that they can construct society into this utopia. This gets to the second belief, that we can actually form human nature in some kind of utopia whatever that utopia happens to be at the time, the problem with this sense of governing is that you're never actually sure what they mean by good. What is the right way to actually form human nature? I have a real problem with that. I think the purpose of government is simply to protect your inalienable rights. It's how our country was founded. It's how we got the miracle that we have today. You see everything around you. We're always talking about how bad we have it. The truth is quite the opposite. We have it incredibly good. The fifth thing this gets to is a sense of gratitude, and I want to talk about some sustainable cultural narratives and some unsustainable cultural narratives. If you ever listen to Turning Point events or a lot of my other fellow conservative commentators, we often say that politics is downstream of culture. And I worry a lot about the direction of our culture. We can fight about the policies and tax policies and how to reform Social Security, but cultural issues are, are up front and center. 
I think there's five things that we need to have a sustainable culture. I'm gonna go through them as quickly as possible because I know we wanna to get to questions. One is personal responsibility. And I know we say that a lot, but I don't know that I always, we always explain why it's proper and why it's really important. Personal responsibility is important because if you don't have it, then by definition, you believe others should be responsible for you. If you believe others should be responsible for you, then it's really no wonder that you might be inclined to believe in socialism. The other problem is that if you're not personally responsible, you're not empowered. And if you're a disempowered person, if you believe that somebody else is in charge of your destiny, well then, you become depressed. You become bored. You don't want to contribute. You can't sustain a society when more and more people don't believe that personal responsibility is a fundamental building block of a strong society, we become weaker. We start to lose our sense of self. The second thing is mental toughness. Basic mental toughness and discipline. So mental toughness meaning, can you thrive in a free society where people are saying things that you might not like? Are you outraged by that? Are you offended? Are you always looking for a reason to be offended? Again, as this spreads, as this issue spreads, I don't know how we survive as a society. And discipline, this is closely related to, to personal responsibility. Can you forego drinking beer and pay for rent? Can you forego gratitude or gratification? These are things you just teach your kids, really. But I don't know that we're teaching each other as a culture why they're important. Personal responsibility, discipline. The third thing, sense of duty. Remember I mentioned sense of duty about why the military actually works somewhat. Loyalty to a country, a love of country, and understanding that there's certain things that bring us together as a country, a pluribus unum of many one. This idea that the only colors that really matter are the red, white, and blue. That is what I mean by sense of duty to a country. And this is problematic if you start to not believe in this, if you start to believe that our country was founded on bad ideas and bad things and genocide, as some people say. Well, then you know, it's also easy to believe that we should have open borders. If you don't believe in the sovereignty of your country, if you don't really care about your sense of duty to that country in the first place. And the fourth thing is virtue and where we get that virtue from. And I argue that it's from God. And we have no choice but to believe that because if it's not from God, then by definition, it's just an opinion that somebody holds. Atheists can be great people, morally good people. But I always ask atheists, where did you get your morality from? It's hard to answer that question. And they'll say, well, experiences. Yes, experiences, because you grew up in a Judeo-Christian society, whether you like it or not. A lot of our laws, a lot of our basic laws and the ways we treat each other, they come from Judeo-Christian history, and I think that's really, really important. The Constitution is inadequate for any other kind of people but a moral one. And we have to be honest about where we get our morality from. And it's absolute morality. It's not relative. It can't be our opinion, because then it can change. And when it can change, then you get the atrocities of the 20th century. You get those atrocities that took place under secular socialism. And the final thing is liberty. Liberty is the most important thing, perhaps. And I don't really need to explain what that means to you, but I would point out that it's not the same as freedom. Freedom is just do whatever you want. Liberty is ordered freedom. And you can't get liberty from without all of those things I mentioned. If you're not personally responsible, well, we can't have a society of personally irresponsible people because then by definition, you believe that somebody else should be responsible for you. And you have to ask someone to infringe on somebody else's freedoms on your behalf because you're not responsible for yourself. Now you're starting to see where policy starts to come out of these cultural discussions. If you're not morally good, then we can't trust you with freedom. Everything builds into freedom. If you're not mentally tough, meaning you can't survive in a free society where you have to compete, or you can't live with freedom. Everything builds on this. There are some unsustainable cultural narratives, and I hit on these before. I think identity politics is one of them. Why? Because it causes resentment and division. I don't see how it helps any of us. The second one, when we start to view the world through a lens of oppressors and victims. Again, this causes resentment, and it encourages groups to seek power over other groups. And it encourages politicians to promise groups that they will give them more power over another group. 
It is the worst way to run a society, and I think it's killing us as a culture. Third thing, victimhood and hypersensitivity to other ideas. This gets into that mental toughness issue. We're creating angry and weak-minded people. We shouldn't be that way. This is America, we have a pioneering spirit. We're the greatest country that ever was. We created the best ideas that mankind ever had. We wrote them all down. And the fourth thing, this idea that wealth is bad, that it should be punished, that we should be resentful for people that do well, that we should believe that they're not paying for their fair share, even though I think the top 1% pays like 37% of all income taxes. And like I said, if you want the people that aren't paying their fair share, go to Denmark. This removes incentives. It's an unsustainable cultural trend. Because why keep paying for things for other people if you know that the money you make isn't going to go to you? Where's your incentive? Where's your incentive? Let's get to the last thing. What I believe conservative stands for, fundamentally what it stands for. It's gratitude. It's gratitude for what got us here. It's gratitude for the fact that our biggest complaint, generally speaking, on a place like this, is whether the supercomputer in our pocket is getting Wi-Fi or not. I mean, it's kind of an amazing time we live in. We should have gratitude for that. It doesn't mean we think we're perfect. It doesn't mean we think that our country hasn't committed atrocities in the past. And we have. But I would point out that it's the founding ideals, the greatest ideas that mankind ever had. Where we, and we got those from Jerusalem, where we found moral truth, and Athens, where we found reason, and Rome, where we understood law and heritage, and London, where we understood that even kings are subject to law, and that personal property rights create a free society. We took all that and we put them in the American founding. And we didn't always live up to that founding, but we used those ideas to combat the evils of slavery, to combat the evils of Jim Crow. And Martin Luther King made his stance. He used the ideas that America was founded on to make his case. That's an incredible thing. It's an incredible thing, and it has created the prosperity that we have in this country. And I think that's what we should be grateful for, and I think that's what we should fight for, and I think that's why I think socialism sucks. Okay. Question. Hey guys, Benny Johnson here from Turning Point USA. Another round of applause for Congressman Crenshaw. Fantastic. We're going to have mics. Mics are going to be brought out here. We would like for this to be an orderly process. There's, a, we're, We'll be alternating questions between the mics. Uh, we have people there to man the mics. Please don't grab them or handle them yourself. And please, I'm begging you, I know you're all very smart, you're much smarter than me, you're not as smart as Dan, but please ask very si short questions. Okay. No speeches, gotcha. ask yeah. questions, please. Cool, cool, cool. All right? Uh, so if you are ready, if you want to ask questions, I believe we have a line here, and we have a line already started here, yes? Okay. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm from Texas, El Paso, Texas. My name is Paul Malouli. Um, one of my questions is, what do you think is the best way to reduce the debt over time? Because okay. we're going to have to handle it, you know, so what do you think is the best way to do it? Yeah, I, I talked about this a minute ago, and um, I'm glad you asked, because I, I, I think this is our generation's biggest problem, and we got to be honest about how to solve it. And so I, I went into the math before about what's actually causing it, and it's, it's really hard to argue that it's anything else but our entitlement spending. So, I'm going to divide spending into two categories, discretionary and mandatory. Discretionary spending is what we fight about every single year at the budget, on the budget committee and, well, in Congress. It, that funds our military, it funds every federal agency you can think of, it funds most of the things that you are aware of. Um, mandatory spending is actually 70% of our spending, on track to be more, because the discretionary as a percentage of our spending keeps decreasing, to include the military. As a percentage of GDP, it continues to decrease. Mandatory spending continues to increase. Why? Because healthcare costs keep rising and our population is aging. So I'm gonna be honest with you guys, we got kind of screwed by the baby boomers. 
We did. They didn't have enough kids. They didn't have enough of you. All right, there's not enough of you paying into the system. They're aging and they're retiring and we promised too much. Again, this is what happens when you have centralized control. This is what happens when you believe a group of experts can create the perfect program. They can't, they never do, ever. <laughs> the military is the closest thing we have to a perfect public program. And it's, it's not perfect, but it is pretty awesome. Um, okay, so what do we do about that? Okay, raise the retirement age. Like our contribution as young people is going to have to be that we're gonna have to retire later. I firmly believe that. And it doesn't mean that we, we tell somebody who's 60 years old right now that they're gonna retire later. We can't, they've been planning on that. What people don't realize is that over the last few decades, the retirement age has been continually increasing. I think by two months a year, it's an incremental thing, but it recently stopped because the end of, that was the end of the plan. It was the end of the legislation. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta up that. Um, I think a more premium-based, uh, or premium support-based Medicare system would be better. Medicaid should be block granted. That would save money and give states the opportunity to actually uh, design programs that work for them. And on Social Security also, I think we should consider means testing it. Means testing the benefits. So there's another line of thought out there that would say, let's increase the amount that's taxable. So right now it's maximum taxable to, I think, $120,000 around there. Here's why I disagree with that. I'd rather, I'd rather let people make it in life and then have all the money they need and then not give them benefits, as opposed to taxing you more now while you're trying to raise a family, create a business, make it in life. I don't want to tax you now. I want to just not give you too many benefits later. That's just, I, I think that's just a better way of looking at the policy. So those, those are some ideas. Over here. I'm a big fan. Thank Thanks. you for coming. History has shown that socialism never works. That being said, are there any redeemable factors you find in socialism? Like it, it always depends on what people mean by it, which is why I started out that way. Like I, you know, there are so many people who, uh, I saw this debate between a, a kid at a campus and Ben Shapiro. And they got into it about, this, he's a socialist, and Ben's like, I'm, socialism's bad. <laughs> and the kid's like, well, what about this company in Spain that basically shares all its profits with all of its workers? It's like a workers' co-op. And Ben asks, well, does the state make them do that? He's like, no, they just decide to do it. It's their business model, and it works. Okay, well, that's not socialism. It's like not even close to socialism. The, the state control of capital and price setting and wage setting by the state, that, that's socialism. And, 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 you know, it's important to define it that way, but it's also important to give people an out. Like, if you mean something else, I'll, let me allow you to mean something else, and, and let's hopefully come to terms on definitions. And so, you know, I guess the redeemable quality on a moral level is that you, deep down, you want to help other people. I think that's what well-intentioned liberalism is. But I, but I made this argument briefly before, that always leads to more control, because there's never enough. There's always injustice. And if you look hard enough, you'll always find it. So you're always gonna want more control and more centralized control to stop that injustice, whether it's real or perceived. This is why it always leads to totalitarianism. It might take some time, but we're having those discussions right now. I mean, I think we've had really normal debates uh, in our political history for, for a while now. You know, maybe, maybe the Democratic Party, I think used to be more of a labor party. Okay, that's a reasonable debate to have between a labor party and a more capitalist party. But now we're talking about Green New Deals, which is a complete takeover of your life. And so, and I don't think it has anything to do with climate change, by the way, because if it did, why would it try to eliminate nuclear energy? And so this stuff doesn't, it doesn't make sense anymore. So um, the redeemable quality is, you know, if you want to help other people, at least I, I think that's a, that's a good thing for you. I just don't think it works. So just an FYI, if you disagree, you'll get to come to the front of the line. So here's an explanation. Oh man, this is making it. How's it going, Dan? Hey. So, um, so if to, if to, be, to the best of my knowledge, you define socialism as centralized, like a centralized state government that controls the means of production, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, I would have to disagree with that. I'm not here to defend the USSR or anything like that, but I'm here to get the understanding of what socialism is because I feel like people at least need to understand it. Yeah. Now that is that is one form of socialism. The the in the broadest term of the word, this, the word socialism is collective or communal ownership of the means of production. Do we agree? 
Now, there are parts of it that tie into anarchy that are anti-decentralization. Noam Chomsky is one of the most famous anarchist socialists in America. Um, so, um, so, the question that I have for you is, have you heard the story of revolutionary Catalonia? No? I wouldn't be that familiar with it. Would, Would you, you like say, to... Did you say revolutionary Catalonia? Catalonia uh, during the Spanish Civil War in Spain. Oh, okay. yeah. No, my, my, my history on the revolutionary Catalonia isn't isn't great. I'll, I'll admit that to you. All right. You have to let people well, who disagree with um, Dude, would you like me to explain it? But I don't disagree with it. No, I, I prefer you get to a question. Because there's a lot of questions. I mean... Well, that was the All point right, that sorry. I was just trying to go. Okay. <laughs> well, well, but to your point, and, and what I was explaining earlier, I agree, I, and I want to give you this, that people have different definitions of socialism. Yeah. You gave the definition earlier that I generally agree with, and which most economists define as sort of pure socialism. We can talk about socialism on a sliding okay. scale. Okay, yeah. But right? My, my, my answer, okay, so, so now that we have that definition in place, now that we agree yeah. that it, it, that's a form of socialism, ultimately, I would say, um, um, so, you, so ultimately, I would, I, I guess, the question that I have for you. Another part that I wanted to get into is that you explained that you're, that you believe in like your government and your country or whatever. Yeah. So, so ultimately, what, what would, uh, what about, what about when our, when our government does uh, terrible things overseas, like for instance, uh, regime change wars that never work? Do you believe that we can still love our country and obviously criticize what our government does? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> of course. I mean, it, it, we, that's a democracy. I mean, we have a debate over, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to have a debate over whether we should have had regime change in Iraq. I mean, it, it, it's a perfectly reasonable discussion to have. So, so, in your opinion, do you think that the regime, oh, do, do you believe that Iraq was a good thing or a bad thing in the long, okay. in the long run? Well, hindsight 2020, right? Um, it's important to look at the invasion of Iraq in context of the history there. So we had to go back in time a little bit. Like we already had to stop Saddam Hussein from invading another country. Two countries actually. We stopped him from invading Saudi Arabia in the, in the early 90s. When we did that, we didn't, we didn't implement regime change, but what we did find was a very advanced nuclear program. Far more advanced than we'd ever thought. So they had a nuclear weapons program that was far more advanced than we ever thought in the early 90s. The rest of the 90s were this sort of, uh, kind of a mix of a cold war and a hot war with Iraq. Sometimes, you know, we had no-fly zones, we bombed them, they were, they were killing Kurds. I mean, it was, Saddam Hussein was an awful guy. Fast forward to 9-11. 9-11 happens, and America's on a war footing. We're not sure when we're getting hit again. All right, we know we got hit from Afghanistan. I think most people agree that was a quote unquote just war. Um, and then we do have intel, and it's unclear whether this intel is good at the time. In hindsight, we know it was bad intel, that, that there are weapons of mass destruction facilities being built in Iraq. No, it's not, no, we, we have this intel. Again, you, you, can, you can argue that in hindsight, we know it was bad and that was based on terrible source reporting. But, I, I, mean, I have a human's background, so I've done this entire case study in classified settings. Like, it wasn't clear at the time that it was bad intel, all right? And if it was, it didn't make that up the chain of command. So, you know, whether it was good or not depends on, one, the context you're looking at it through, the people in Iraq you talk to. There's a lot of people in Iraq who welcomed us. There's a lot of people who didn't. I was there twice. So I've worked with lots of Iraqis who want nothing more than to have Americans there all the time. They need us. And we never should have left them in 2011 because we had to go right back. And I don't think we should leave again, not until they're truly ready. Um, so it is a perfectly reasonable stance to take to say that ah, we shouldn't have gone there, that it was, it was, it was bad. But, and you can make that argument. It doesn't make you un-American if, that, if that, that was your original question. I think we should move on. Hey guys, we're doing one question each. No more statements, no more definitions, no more Freudian uh, 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 whatever. Please, a question for the congressman. Thank you. Again, if anybody disagrees, please come to the front of the line. Yeah, let's go, let's go. The guy with the guitar. Hey, you did. <laughs> oh, you disagree? No, disagree. Okay. Yeah, go, go. Yeah. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for your service, by the way. Thank you. Um, I just have a, 
One thing I want to ask you about is if you've come up with any kind of solution for automation of labor. So this is where I don't think capitalism can probably give a holistic approach for a solution. So I wonder if you had, if you had ever thought of a solution towards the automation of labor that's going on in the United States and abroad right now. Yeah. Um, and that should be kind of a bipartisan problem that we're trying to solve. Vocational training is the solution. You need people to be looking at other options in their education besides wonderful places like this. This is maybe good for all of you guys to come here, but it's not good for everybody. Pell Grants need to be available for non four-year degrees. It's unbelievable to me that, that that's not that's not the system right now. That you basically means you, you can't take out a student loan to go get a you know a pipe fitting degree. Right, which takes you six months and you make like 75K a year. This is amazing stuff. Now the private sector is really leading the way on this. And so the question, and, and I, at least where I'm from in Houston, man, I see it all the time. Like all of these, all of these big companies creating these programs in really cool and, and I guess what some would label as progressive ways in, in the sense that like they'll only have a program for, for women of color. And, it's, and they're training these, these folks to be pipe fitters and they're training them to be welders. This is a job that's not going away anytime soon, and uh, it's extremely beneficial for people. And um, the, the question is, like, what's the right public-private partnership? Because we always want to help, and then we get in the way, and then we screw it up. So I don't want that to happen. Um, I, I think I think giving incentives for apprenticeships and and allowing the private industry to really move this stuff forward is is going to be extremely important. Uh, as we deal with the automation issue, because you know the automation is not going to happen overnight, right? right? So we, we are going to have some time to adapt, and um, and uh, we, we've we've got to encourage those cultural foundations I mentioned. Encourage people. Hey, if you got to get up and move, sometimes you got to get up and move and go find the work. There's plenty of work here. We have more jobs available than we have unemployed people. It's a good problem to have in America. We're like the only. I mean, it's, it's not bad right now, but um, the people need the skills to move up that economic ladder. That labor productivity is the biggest thing holding back GDP growth. Meaning, you know, what, what, what the, the unit of work you put in and what that's worth. Okay, so you get more of that by creating better skills and therefore being being available for, for better jobs. So vocational training is huge and, and, um, and getting that into the high schools is, is huge. And how we do that is, is something we're always trying to figure out. And I would say this administration is working quite a bit on that. Ivanka Trump in particular is, is wholeheartedly invested in this particular idea. That and a conservative solution to paid family leave, which I'm a big part of as well. Hey, um, you said that the Nordic countries were more capitalist, so I just want to know if you support social democracy, free healthcare, free college, high wages, all that good stuff. Wait, wait, uh, repeat that, please. You said that the Nordic countries were more capitalist in America, right? Than America. In many ways, yeah. So yeah, do you support social democracy over what we have now, like free healthcare? Well, what, what Nordic countries have are big social programs. They're not socialists, and they get really offended when you call them socialists, you know? Uh, and for good reason. They have a far more aggressive tax system than we do, and they, they regulate their businesses in, I think, a more streamlined way than we do. And again, it depends on how you measure that. Like the Heritage Foundation puts Nordic countries ahead of us as far as economic freedom index goes. Um, the OECD measure puts us about the same. So they're just as good or better than us when it comes to regulatory freedom. So I do like a lot of that. The, the, what they have is an understanding within their very homogenous population, by the way, where they don't get a lot of immigration, and they're not very diverse, um, and they say, hey, we want to raise our taxes to this to include the lower and middle income class. So it depends. It's like, if we were having an honest conversation doing what they do here, we would offer the middle class and lower income cl class people to drastically raise their taxes. Like I said, $70,000 a year, 46% tax rate, and here's what you get as a result of that. Are you willing to pay that or not? That would at least be an honest political debate. Unfortunately, that's never the political debate here. What we're always saying is that we're gonna tax the rich. Here's the thing. If you tax the, uh, uh, the 10 millionth dollar at 70%, that was the, the recent tax plan floated around a lot, that gets you $700 billion over the course of 10 years, which is practically nothing. Practically nothing in the grand scheme of things. I mean, when you're talking about a $32 trillion Medicare for all scheme. So you do have to tax the middle class and you do have to do it in a regressive way. There's just no choice there. So we can have that debate, and I'll simply say, 
I want to keep more of my money, I know what to do with it better, and the free market knows what to do with it better, and you can say, no, it doesn't, and, and we can have that debate, and at least it would be honest. But it's, it's important that people understand that you, if, you, if you want to create those programs, you've got to tax the middle class. Uh, hi. Um, I was also in the Navy. Uh, not as cool as you, uh, but I was also. Cool. <laughs> Seals um, think they're really cool, but... <laughs> so, uh, My wife tells me I'm not. <laughs> She's wrong. Okay. Um, Next so, question. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll get to the question. Uh, so you were saying for the same reason, or for the very reason that the military is um, an organization full of duty, that it's cheap. Um, I disagree with that. Um, I think the military is losing its sense of duty. It's becoming this identity politics machine. And uh, I think it could be a lot cheaper by reallocating funds rather than dumping more money into it. You know, like rather than making all commands spend all of their budgets, don't do that. What, are you, gonna, what are you going to do to fix the identity politics problem with the military and the, uh, the inefficiency of just money in the military? The, the cultural problem you're referring to, I, I, I mean, I, I just hope you're wrong. I hope it's not as bad as you say it is. It's certainly not that bad in the special operations community. Maybe it is in the in the, the more mainstream Navy, and and I do and I and you're right. I, I do see proof of that sometimes. I think it's been reversed uh, under under this administration to an extent. But um, that's a cultural problem that legislators can't fix. The people in here have to fix that. Our our society has to fix that. We have a, as a people need to fix our cultural problems. That, that I that I that's why I delve into that so deeply because it's so important and it leads to really weird policies when we get the cultural narratives wrong um, you are absolutely right about the budgeting and, and you know a simple a simple attaboy for a commander that doesn't spend all their money and puts that back in the treasury so for people who don't understand what we're talking about in all of federal government by the way it's not just the military there's an incentive to spend your entire budget and if you don't you might not get that same budget next year just give the military a predictable budget every year and we will save money and I have I have sat down with the CNO the chief of naval operations and all military leaders and I say listen I am not for continuing to raise the DOD budget to exceptional degrees I'm not that kind of fiscal defense hawk I can still be a defense hawk and, and say that we don't need to keep raising this what they need is a five-year budget that is predictable so they can get their contracts in, look where to save money. We can trust them to find savings if we give them that, that predictability and uh, flexibility. The same with the VA. This is what everybody wants. If we can get people in place, administrators that we trust, um, and, and, and not raise their budget all the time, but give them predictability in that budget, we'll actually see cost savings over the, over the course of a few years. Please do something. <laughs> hey Dan, how's it going? Um, one thing that's increasing in popularity for the people who are running uh, for Democrat in 2020 is the idea of regulating big pharma. Uh, I think everyone here would agree that we all want everyone to be able to afford their pharmaceuticals and the uh, treatment they need. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the United States government's role in actually rating or regulating private pharmaceutical companies. Well, they're regulated quite heavily right now. Um, the the debate is more about how you keep costs down, and how do you how do you how do you get those price controls down? And you know, the idea thrown out there, of course, is is allow Medicare to negotiate, right? Because we have a not even negotiating power as a government to so negotiate with drug companies. Um, you know, the more I look into that one, the less sure I am that that will work. I'm not I was not ultra opposed to that at first. I, I can make I can. I can do some mental gymnastics and call that a free market solution. It's a negotiation in the end, but um, there's there's now some evidence that I'm not, I'm not so sure that will work. Um, so we got to look at what drives costs. Um, a lot of the a lot of the red tape that you have to go through to get a drug approved by the FDA, I think, could be removed. So let's get these things approved faster. Um, there's a huge amounts of costs associated with this. I mean, absolutely enormous. Um, and, and and changing the incentive structure so that we're actually investing in drugs like Alzheimer's drugs, which, which there, there, there's some incentives not to invest in that stuff right now for some companies. And I, and I think there's probably some room for, for government to make this a, a little bit more of an efficient system. You know, tr trying to wrap your head around the, the most complex market in the world, which is the United States healthcare market, and all the baggage that has come with it. That's why, that's why 
it's not as easy as okay Medicare for all it's just not that easy we are we are quite a different country we have a lot of structural inefficiencies built into it that we have to address there's a lot of different players it's not just pharmacy it's pharmacy benefit managers but here's a here's one thing that we might agree on you know we need to remove the incentive structure for pharmacy benefit managers to basically take rebates from pharmaceutical companies i would look into this i, I i'm not going to explain this this is this is a real deep part of um a part of the the healthcare debate but there's there's pharmacy benefit managers bringing in billions and billions and billions of dollars, and they don't really offer a service, all right, because their incentive structure is backwards. So that's a problem. And the hospitals have their own, have their own kind of rice bowl interests that you know they're really just looking out for themselves. Physicians and insurance companies and pharmacies. All of these have to be figured out, and it is never as simple as, as Medicare for all. And, and conservatives have to come up with a. A easier way to market our solutions, our more free market solutions, and help people understand them in less than five seconds. Unfortunately, that's that's the world we live in: is five second sound bites, and uh, we we have to do better on that. All right, guys. The university is telling us that we have two time for two more questions. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. The second in line. Uh, but I have a request. If you self-identify as a socialist, if you identify as a socialist, or if you're, uh, I don't know, like socialist life, uh, if you're socialist open, I want you to come to the front of the line. I want a question from someone who self-identifies as a socialist. Uh, TPUSA is for Nazis, and you should be ashamed of your service in Afghanistan. It was an illegal war of aggression by the United States. You should be ashamed of yourself, not proud of your service. If, if you have to call somebody a Nazi, it, it's a good indicator that you haven't thought through your argument very well. That was fun. At least we had some, a little bit of... Okay. Get more creative with your insults, man. <laughs> Come on. Right. Um, so you've talked a lot about how identity politics is a cultural issue that we should maybe be solving within ourselves as a population. Um, and I, I agree with that in terms of government interference and a lot of times lead to snafus. But um, I'm just wondering because identity politics, I think, while it has been weaponized a lot recently, is kind of an old age issue and people have always and maybe will always feel yeah. individual allegiance to pieces of their identity. So I guess my question is how, because you don't think that government should get directly involved, do you, do you what are, what, what are, yeah. Well you, well you solve it with Western enlightenment ideals, you know, putting primacy on individual freedom. So we actually did solve it, right? Like, cause you're absolutely right. It is ingrained in us. What, what, what is in our DNA is not Western civilization, enlightenment ideals. What is in our DNA is those identity politics. It is tribal in nature. We have always acted this way as human beings. It is only recently that we have, that we have, that we have in, encountered this miracle that is Western civilization. It's not normal, right? And so that's why I always go back to the miracle of Western civilization and, and the greatest ideas that we ever had, and we finally wrote them down in 1776. That's why, um, because they're exactly they're exactly right, and that's why it's so important to keep educating ourselves on what created the prosperity that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm a survival of socialism, and when I hear um, the story about the pharmaceutical things, what I have done for 21 years, uh, 28 years, I was actually uh, basically experiment for the medical field, and they've done everything wrong, and then I was about 30 years old, I said, I will figure it out what's wrong with me, and I found a way which is most sustainable, which is a Chinese medicine, natural herbs, and I want you to know how we can bring this to our legislation in GOP to bring more sustainable a healthcare system to, to our people. 
just like homeopathic medicine? Not just homeopathic, horrible. The most ethical yeah. medicine is the Chinese medicine. I discovered yeah. to travel the world and talk. Yeah, but I'm generally for more freedom and experimenting and trying these things out. I'd have, I would certainly have to learn more about it, but we're all, huh? I think that's perfectly acceptable. Daisy Patriots? So, I've been hearing a lot from Alexandria Ocasio and Elizabeth Warren about how they'd like to make education and healthcare universal. And uh, she was saying something about, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But obviously, we all know that there's something wrong with the VA healthcare system and, you know, with higher education. Like, how would you suggest, since I haven't seen really any, any concrete suggestions from Republicans especially, how would you suggest that we counterattack those ideas and we um, try to, do you think that maybe reducing the deficit in spending would help? Like, what would you suggest? Okay, so a lot to unpack there. Um, the, 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 the free education proposals as well as how to fix the VA. Um, so, so talking about what Elizabeth Warren's recent proposal was, which is effectively, if you make below a hundred thousand dollars, well, I, I think it was, we will com completely do away with your debt up to fifty thousand dollars in student debt, and and, and up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. I have a big problem with this because what you're you're basically saying is that people who chose to take out a loan and they they did that cost benefit, right? They said, I'm going to get this amount of value out of a university education and I'm gonna be able to get this kind of job based on that university education or choose the right major. I'm gonna make that choice, I'm gonna take out a loan, I'm gonna pay it back. Now I'm telling the rest of Americans, many of which do not have a college degree, that their tax dollars have to go towards repaying that. And that's fundamentally unfair, it's fundamentally regressive as well. Um, and it's also fundamentally uh, not affordable either. You know, again, we have to raise our, we always have to, something has, somebody has to pay for this stuff. Um, and it makes you devalue your education also if you're getting it for free. This should also be noted. I brought up that statistic about the Nordic countries before. They get less value out of their education system. And, and we can hypothesize forever about why that might be. But I think a big part of it is that when something is free to you, you just don't value it as much. You don't put the effort into it. And, and, I, and I think that matters. Again, this is a cultural thing, less so than a, I don't know how to fix that with policy, getting you to value something more. But the bottom line is, it, it's, it's not affordable. Um, and, and again, I, I would always go back to, let's talk about vocational training. Let's talk about other means of education that give you a better outcome and, and are better cost benefit. Um, the, 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 it's ain't broke, don't fix it uh, comment about the VA was it, it just purely based on ignorance. That's, of, of, of course that's not true. And, um, now, at, at the same time, I would, I, I am not one of these politicians who stands on my soapbox and just bashes the VA and says how horrible it is. I go to the VA. I continue getting my care at the VA now, and I want it to be better, and they want it to be better. These are not bad people working there. So, so some, of the, some of the ways that we, I think it's getting better uh, under this administration, we made it easier to hire and fire people. You have to hold people accountable. A lot of people don't realize this about federal government. It is extremely difficult to fire somebody who's underperforming. And this decreases morale in terrible ways. When you work next to somebody who doesn't do their job but can't be fired, what does that do to your morale? It makes you not want to go to work either. It's, it's, it's bad and there's, and there's also a high regulatory environment there that makes it really hard for individual administrators to get the job done. And I am a victim of this. When I go to the VA sometimes, they'll be like, we can argue that pair, because I mean, my eyes are all messed up, right? So I have a cataract in this eye, I use a contact, I need, I need seeing glasses on top of it, I need all these things. We can argue this pair of glasses, but not that pair of glasses, because you have to go to a different optometrist who does. And at that point, my phone ran out of space. But thank you so much to Dan Crenshaw for coming to Arizona State University and speaking today. Sadly, I never got to ask my question. I was second in line, but since everyone else disagreed with him, they got in front and got to ask their questions. If I could have asked my question, I would have asked him, what are at the roots of why socialism has become so desirable for students on campuses? But, hey, I guess that's not the end of the world. You can still have that discussion in the comments below. If you found this video to be worth your time, please feel free to leave a like. If it wasn't worth your time, Go ahead and leave a dislike. I don't care. Subscribe if you want more content, and that way I can also get that sweet monetization and stream events like this in the future. Share it if you think someone else might find it useful. And until next time, don't forget to contribute. Make the most of your day.